Dr. Derek Mahoney here with uh, Dr. Isabel Drooling in the background. Uh, we're here to chat to our favourite patient, um, uh, Olivia, uh, about her experience with the MSC technique. Um, Dr. Drooling and I have been using this technique for a few years. Uh, we learned it from Professor Juan Moon uh, at UCLA. We're amazed at the results and obviously uh, many doctors want to learn how to do this technique. But there's not a lot on social media uh, from a patient's perspective and I get emails every day from patients asking you know um, how long will it take will it be painful uh, so what we thought is we get a patient we've actually done the procedure on uh, to, to chat about her experiences right um, so Olivia thanks very much for doing this no um, can I start by just showing you when when you first saw me um, you had already had um, previous orthodontics right That's correct. Um, so, do you want to tell me uh, why you think your bite changed um, between when you had your braces off, uh, I guess as a teenager, yes. uh, and when you presented uh, to me at age 22? Yes, so the first time I had orthodontics, I had an expander that only went around my molars. Mm -hmm. um, so they did expand, but they expanded only dentally, um, and they didn't account for the placement of my jaw, um, so they didn't expand the yeah, that's, yeah, so, exactly. and, that, and, that, and that's a common problem we see in patients uh, because uh, again for the audience when you do expansion of the palate um, you're talking about these two bits of bone connected this way right so if you use my nose as an example uh, and I superimpose a high palate it actually affects a lot of the nasal cavity if I then expand the palate and change the skeletal structure, it changes the nasal airway. Now, if you look at Olivia's original records when she came to see us, she has a crossbite on both sides besides uh, already uh, having orthodontics. And if we then examine the uh, upper jaw, you can see that because the upper jaw is narrow, she is putting her tongue between the teeth. This is what we call a uh, tongue thrust. Also, when you expand teeth rather than bone, can you see the recession that occurs on the teeth? Um, so what we've done, in her case, we've realized that the palate, the bone, is actually the problem, not the teeth. So we are using the One Moon Designed MSE, uh, which stands for uh, Maxillary Skeletal Expansion. Um, and rather than put forces on the teeth, we're putting the forces through the palate, right? So my, my uh, next question to you is when you first came for a consult, and I showed you all this, I know you were a little bit um, uh, hesitant to proceed. Um, how do you feel now? Um, was it as painful as you thought? Um, and I guess the main question is, would you do it again? I'd definitely do it again after seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. The yeah. first couple of days were tricky um, in figuring out where to put your tongue and yeah. how to do all the basic things you don't even think of. Yeah. Um, it's very similar to getting your wisdom teeth out in the fact that your mouth's very sensitive and swollen and it's gone through quite a lot of trauma in a day. Right. Um, so I would suggest sticking to soft foods uh, for a couple of days, having some downtime, lots of rest and um, drugs if you need it. Don't try and be here because it, it is painful for yeah. a couple of days. But it definitely does get better um, and the results yeah. And, and on that point, before MSC technique was around, the only option I could offer someone like you as an adult would be a surgical expansion of the jaw. Now, that's a really big deal. That's general anaesthetic, and the surgeon would um, cut here and here, and sometimes on the middle, and then kind of split your jaw, right? Um, the recovery time is a lot more and um, uh, we just find that many adults the moment they saw the max fact surgeon sort of decided just to live with their problems or went off and did silly things like used invisalign to straighten their teeth which of course is not going to fix the real problem right exactly. now let's talk about breathing because a lot of patients come to see me for this technique not because they're all worried about their bite or the appearance of the teeth but because they snore or they have sleep apnea um, can you tell me, have you noticed a change in your breathing since we widened your palate? I definitely can through my nose. Um, I was saying before, I would do a lot of meditation where the guided meditation is saying, now breathe in through your nose, and I would get very lightheaded because I wasn't getting enough oxygen through my nose. Um, I've noticed now 
after doing it, I can definitely breathe way easier through my nose and I'm snoring a lot less. So you're definitely... Great, great. And, and on that point, Isabel and I have been on a quest for many years to offer patients an improvement in their airway, not just straight teeth. Uh, and we do a lot of kids, uh, which you know, uh, work well without needing this procedure because their suture is kind of wide open. You know? And so take a message, if you've got a child between seven and nine who has breathing problems or a narrow palate or a crossbite, that's the age to actually do it. I'm not saying wait till 21 to get it done. Right? Um, so another question, um, and be honest with this one, right? Um, what would you say is the downside of this procedure? I think the gap, for sure, yeah. knocked my confidence around a lot, especially being 21, being yeah. very social and meeting new people. But a good time with COVID, because you yeah, can, uh, definitely. have a mask out and, and my mask light, I was <laughs> all the time, never going anywhere. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, definitely I think the gap knocked my confidence around a lot. Um, I was getting headaches um, within the first couple of weeks, just as everything was getting used to everything. Yeah. Um, I was getting a bit of a clicky jaw sometimes, that only lasted for a couple of days. They're all very minor issues, but I can see how that would be annoying for someone with a low pain threshold or someone that's a bit nervous to get it done to start with anyway. But I think the results speak for themselves and it's definitely worth it. And now, thinking back to when the appliance was first fit, you know, uh, obviously um, your tongue doesn't know what to do because all of a sudden there's this thing in the mouth. Exactly. Um, how do you kind of cope with that? Uh, lots of smoothies. Okay. Yeah, good, good. Um, it was fine implementing it. I was I mean, obviously had a steady anesthetic. Um, couldn't feel much. Definitely after I was very feeling very sorry for myself. Lots of cold smoothies, protein shakes, um, soft foods for the first couple of days, and just lots of rest. I, I slept away. A couple of days just so I didn't have to feel any, any pain or anything, but a couple of Panadols on your yeah. definitely helped as well. So, um, now in a minute, we're going to demonstrate how you turn the key, right? But again, one of the questions patients always ask me okay, once that's in the mouth, um, who turns the key and how often is it turned? And you know, they're surprised when I say, listen, you can turn it yourself. Can you tell me how your experience was? I'll just show the audience. So, that's the key. It's um, uh, custom made for this appliance. The original appliance we use, which I think MSC version one, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the way to turn was a little hole and patients found it really hard to put um, uh, effectively a pin into that hole and turn it. So what Wan Moon did with his engineers in Korea, uh, uh, they were able to come up with like a spanner and the spanner makes it much easier to uh, do the turning and also gives you a better grip uh, for that. So, can, so that, that's just to show you the turn that's done. Do uh, you want to, sorry, describe a little bit about how you went with that? Yeah, so it's funny the first couple of days, obviously, the new appliance in your mouth that you're not used to. Um, like you said, I did it myself. I did it up against the bathroom mirror, um, put the torch on my iPhone, shone it in there. And you just play around for a little bit, feel around, you can get the gist of it, you know, when it's clicked in and then you just go straight down and it's, it's all done. So it does take some getting used to. I had my partner next to me saying, oh, go to your left, go to your right. Okay. Um, shining a light in your mouth definitely helps. But um, by the end of it, you can just freestyle and <laughs> you know exactly where you're going. I always say to patients, it's a bit like if your car breaks down and you've got to push it, you need a lot of force to get it going, right? Yeah, but it. once the wheels are rolling, it's easy, and that's why exactly. that... Yeah, exactly. Sure. Perfect. Okay, um, so what we're going to do now is ask you to hop in the chair. Dr. Isabel is going to kind of demonstrate a little bit in the mouth and also show uh, the photos of where you started and where you are now. Sure. Um, and if I can just... Again, you can see the palette, how narrow it is there, and if we look at uh, this photo, you can see how much expansion has occurred. Now, we've taken that uh, photo literally today. So what you'll see is we've now cut the arms off the appliance, uh, but we're maintaining that expansion. I'll get Isabel to talk more on that. And that's that uh, gap that Olivia, of course, was concerned about aesthetically, and I get that. For some patients, Olivia's not your ideal patient, that's why we <laughs> asked her to do the uh, interview, but we do get some patients who literally freak out by the gap. So what we then do is work with their general dentist and get the general dentist to put on either side of the tooth like a white resin which sticks to the tooth. The downside there is you don't have the gap but then you have these two massive looking teeth. So you know it's one or the other. 
Um, uh, so uh, do you want to come and yeah. sit in the chair? So this is Olivia, and this is how we started, and this is how she looks now. So basically the MSC is like an expansion screw that connects the screw to the bone, yeah, to the palate. So these are the four tabs, or mini screws we use for that. These tabs are inserted, inserted under local anesthesia, so the patient doesn't feel any kind of pain. Um, the patient only feels kind of pressure. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, if the patient feels any kind of pain, we just add some more uh, anesthesia and then it should be fine. And just on, on that point, I just want people to understand this is a custom made oral appliance. This is like, this appliance is, um, uh, if you're getting a dress, you've got the choice of buying it off the rack uh, or getting custom made. We organize a special x-ray, which is a CT scan. So we need to look at the depth of the bone and helps us decide yes. what type of uh, expansion screw we're going to use, where the four tads are going to go. Um, and that's an important part of the uh, uh, diagnosis. Yes, exactly. We choose on her skull where to place the tads and how long they have to be. So once the four tads are inserted, I ask the patient to turn around four times a day. Can you please show us? How you do the extension? So you just wrap the floss, which you'll be given with the spanner, around your finger so you don't swallow or choke on it. Um, and then put your head back and just go up and down, like when you're in the little middle part. Or alternatively, you can go up against a glass mirror, preferably in the bathroom, shine a light on it, and you'll definitely see a lot more where you're, where you're going. Um, but just make sure that you've got the floss around your finger because you don't want to digest this. Mm. So actually what, every time she turns the expander, the pressure goes straight to the bone, yeah? And in the palate, in the middle of the palate, there is like a suture. So every time she turns the key, that suture starts to open, yeah? But it goes like this and all of a sudden that suture opens. On that moment, they feel something. Sometimes is a pop what they hear. Sometimes it's like tickling on the nose. Sometimes it's a weird sensation with the tongue around that area. Is that right? Yeah. What did you feel? Um, I felt a tingle for I'd probably say a day or two. Um, all in my nose and then on my cheekbones as well. It just felt very brittle and just tingly. Um, but no pain or anything like that. No loud pops or cracks. <laughs> and you, you find then after that day much easier to turn, right? Yeah, definitely a lot less pressure. Um, then the gap started to form quite quickly after that. Um, and yeah, no, no headaches as much after that either. So I ask for a turn rate of four times a day until that suture opens. Once that suture is opened, we go down to only two times a day. Yeah. So the whole expansion takes only around three to four weeks, depending on how many millimeters we want to expand. Olivia's case was three weeks, and we got a, around 12 millimeters of expansion. So what happens now is Olivia, she's been with the MSC for three weeks. We cut off the arms here on the sides, and now we're ready to start with braces. Um, the braces can come on around two months after the expansion and it's going to stay in there for another five months more or less just to maintain the expansion we got. And after five months we take everything off. The braces are going to still on until the end of the treatment, until your bite is corrected, but the screws and everything is going to come off after five months. Um, Olivia. What, what time of the day do you think is the best moment to do the expansion? Um, when, we, when I was doing twice a day, I would recommend doing it after breakfast and then after dinner as well, just because you do feel a bit of pressure um, and you don't want to be chewing or biting down on food. It just feels like your tooth's going to crack or come out. So I definitely recommend giving yourself some time before mm -hmm. and after eating to spin. And what about when you're doing the more rapid expansion? 
the beginning? Um, so four times a day, I was doing twice before breakfast and twice after right. dinner. Okay. Um, you're right to go to bed um, after you you've turned the key. Uh, you don't feel any pain or headaches or anything like that. It's just a little bit of pressure around the teeth, uh, which goes quite quickly. You just don't want to be chewing down on food. So basically, it's around seven to ten days until the suture opens. So for the first week, we are turning four times a day. And after that, we're only turning twice a day until the desired expansion. And like I said, in her case, it was 10 days, right? 10 days until, yeah. And so 10 days of rapid expansion, and then 20 days with slow expansion. And I did make the point earlier about Invisalign. And what I'm trying to say is Invisalign moves teeth, right? It doesn't move bone. So I do have patients with Isabel that we've done the MSE uh, and we've got all the changes we wanted, then the patient really doesn't want anything visible. In those cases, we have used Invisalign, but it's a, a much longer process. You know, For those in uh, Australia, they'll get this. If you're going to Melbourne, back in the day when you could, right, uh, you have the choice of driving there or flying there. Having braces is like flying to Melbourne. Having aligners, you still get there, but it's a much longer pathway. So I just want people to understand, I get emails all the time, you know, can I do MSC and then Invisalign? Yes, you can, but it's a, a much longer pathway. And this poor girl's already had years of braces, so I think <laughs> what she wants to do is just be over and done with it. But again, that's a decision we make. So please understand, Invisalign braces move teeth, right? MSC moves bone, and that's the really big difference. And when you have a palate that's that shape, um, it'll stay that shape as you do dental expansion. But if you do this technique and you get the forces up where you need them to be on the palate, you start seeing this happening. And that's uh, lots of great research by our colleague, uh, Chris Moschik, um, uh, who's um, now in Germany. Uh, he's initially from Austria. He was a student of One Moon, and he did his master's thesis on CBCT changes in airway and tremendous stuff. Uh, so again, anyone who wants references, this is one of the most well-documented techniques. I get patients sending me all these weird and wonderful emails on some weird technique that they found on Google. And I always say, look, send me one evidence paper on that technique, and then we don't hear from the patient again. Mm -hmm. So please, we are people of science, we like this technique, but we didn't just hop in and try it. This has been researched and very well published um, by uh, Professor Juan Moon and all his students, including Daniel Cantalera, who did his mm -hmm. PhD on the topic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Olivia, if you don't mind, I'm just going to show how it looks like in, in my mouth. So, this situation is exactly the, the same we have on the picture. So, we can see the four tags one, two, three, four. Two tabs on each side of the suture. This is very important. And the screw, it's opened. You see the, here the expansion screw is already on 12 millimeters of expansion. And this is how it looks like in the middle of the palate. Of course, at the beginning, the tongue gets a bit sore. So there is something in the middle of the palate that you're not, you're not used to have. So it takes around two to three days to be able to speak and swallow properly. Just let me know if I'm wrong. <laughs> <Not> wrong. <laughs> yeah, but at the beginning, yeah, you need to have like one day off of work for sure. Olivia says up to two, three days. Okay. And yeah, that's the final situation. Like I said, now it's going to be in there for another five to six months.